I've recently been looking into portable uh, open source consoles. And the one that I've ended up deciding on buying is the, called the uh, Game Shell, which is a fully open source, <coughs> um, effectively portable console. And what that, what that means is anyone can modify the code that runs on it. It runs um, an open source distribution of Linux. The hardware is open source. You can find the schematics. You can hack with the device. You can make changes to it, and effectively, when something is open source, that means that it's yours. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you can't open it, you don't own it, and if you don't have the files to build it yourself, you don't own it either. So the reason why the reason why I'm making this video is because I had an idea last night, um, and a lot of it came from my thinking of how do we build more games for these consoles, <clears throat> and not just building games, but actually incentivizing people to build games. Because people that don't know, uh, building video games takes a lot of money, time, and resources. So, <clears throat> and these these machines, these um, there's several of them on the market right now. I personally like uh, this uh, specific one, the uh, the game shell. Uh, not necessarily because of the capabilities or <clears throat> this thing. It is just because it is open source. And the reason why uh, open source portable consoles is interesting isn't just for the hackability. It's for, it's for several reasons, actually. So open source hardware and open source software has far more persistence. Um, and what I mean by that is, let's start with a software example. Uh, Windows developers have a really hard time because they want, because consumers want um, <clears throat> Roller Coaster Tycoon, which was written in assembly in like 1995 or something, to be able to execute on their Windows 10 machine. That is not an easy task. So what you end up with is this like abstraction, uh, very complex, bloated system where in open source land, if Roller Coaster Tycoon was open source, you just recompile the code with the most recent tooling and libraries, etc., and everything just runs fine. And that's why um, most Linux distributions are smaller, more lightweight, and faster than Windows, which is quite bloated and has to deal with legacy code, a lot of legacy code. Um, because, of the rate so at, because of the rate at which software evolves, you, you just get this absolute mess. Um, and similar aspects to hardware. There will be a time in the future when there's no, uh, there's no NESs anymore. And that's just it. You can't build another one. Nintendo doesn't, isn't going to release the design files. NES will effectively die. Now, I don't know if that's going to be 20 years or 40 years or 100 years, but it is, it's not if, it's when. Uh, where in open source hardware, anyone, it can be a third party shop, can just pick up the design files and uh, just run with them and build their own thing. So you have this persistence where you know that if you develop something on this one system that you it will always have value rather than uh, a Nintendo 64 game that's closed source and it will always just be um, Legend of Zelda. Another pro for open source hardware is upgradability. So if you look at the clock, if you look at the game shell, you can see that everything's modular. So if you want to, you can upgrade the screen, you can upgrade the processor, um, etc. With closed source consoles, you get what you buy, and that's pretty much it. Um, which leads to increased e-waste. Now, so I'm talking about. So okay, like, so as far as portable consoles, I don't care about anything that is closed source. That is not even like I'm approaching this from a uh, pragmatic um, hardware uh, electrical engineer developer type of mentality. So I don't care if there's some other console out there. It's like, oh wow, you know, and people are saying, well, why don't you just buy a Switch? Well, again, I don't, I don't care about anything that's closed source. That's not of value to me. Um, not only because you have to jailbreak it and then do all this stuff to get the emulators on it, and then this thing and that thing and that thing, which just isn't user friendly. Nintendo doesn't want you doing that. Um, and it doesn't have the persistence that that I want. I want something, if I design a game for something, I want it to be able to exist forever. And I want anyone to be able to come in and make changes to it and should be able to run it on hardware that is also persistent. Now, I'm sure there's lots of people that would counter this point and say, oh, but there's emulators and this, that, and the other thing. But um, 
I really want to I really want to focus on this open source stuff. And the cool thing about this game shell and lots of other little guys is they're running Linux. So you have uh, you know thousands of kernel developers that are you know putting their blood, sweat and tears to make this the kernel of the thing awesome. So you have you just have all the support of the box. You have USB, you have ethernet, you have etc. like Wi-Fi drivers. All of this stuff is just there for you to to use and leverage. Um and the thing about the the uh, the game shell is right now, to my knowledge, uh, ninety five percent plus of its value to people who like playing games is for emulation. So you load up all your ROMs, you load up your emulators, and you can play game Game Boy Advance games, Game Boy Color, NES, whatever, and N sixty four, which is cool, which is cool. Um, but I am interested in that but I'm also interested in new development of games specific to that console open source games or closed source either or development of games because that console gives a whole new depth of capabilities against the actual native Game Boy Color you have Wi-Fi you have Bluetooth you have um, you know, you can just plug wires into it and make like super simple. You can add sensors to it. You can you can do all of this other interesting stuff that you just can't do with with a Game Boy Color or even with a standard PC. Um, you you just have so much more capabilities. So that's that's where my interest became growing. So I just started thinking about okay, well, how can you incentivize people to build games? And as I was saying earlier in the video, that takes money. So I thought of a custom structure. Right now there's, to my knowledge, two big structures, um, that main structures that people use for building games. Your, uh, the first one is your game shop, you have a ton of money, and you, uh, you just invest all of that money up front, you spin up a team, you release the game, you sell the game, you make your money back, hopefully, plus some extra. And the second one, and so that's not that's not really feasible for indie game developers. And I'm mostly talking, when I'm talking about incentivizing game developers, I'm talking about indie game developers. This is a team of like five people and, you know, they work on a game for a year and build something kick-ass and cool. And it's not going to have like AAA graphics or anything like that. It's going to be something that looks like one of the old Zelda games or Pokemon games. And they're f fun to play. They're rad games, um, but they're just not at the graphical levels and things. That's what I'm more talking about now. So indie, indie developers don't have that initial capital to use that first model. So a lot of them have turned to um, uh, crowdsource funding methods, which is, it's has like the idea of crowdsource funding. I, I like it, but the problem is there's too many people that and it might not necessarily even be their fault. The, it, they might have just over overestimated their capabilities or um, or just made a mistake. And halfway through the project, they run out of cash and they throw their hands up in the air and everyone on the, you know, that funded this thing gets pissed off because, you know, oh, you know, well, game development's really hard. So, um, <clears throat> so crowdsource funding is, it's cool um, and it works for a lot of models like, um, art, I've seen it work well for art, sometimes electronics and hardware development, but there's also a lot of bad stories about that. Um, and then I guess there's a third model, and that's just like grinding after your day job, um, like every day for like four years, and then eventually you'll build something. Um, so those would be the three, three kind of ways to build games that, uh, that I've heard of so far. And last night I thought of a fourth. And I'm going to explain it right now. And it uses blockchain because naturally that is something that I'm interested in. So I'm always thinking of ways that you can build something better than we have using decentralized technology and trustless technology. So this thing works like this. <laughs> okay. Oh. So you have consumers and you have developers. And then what I'm, what I'm calling the war chest. So the war chest is just a smart contract that uh, contains a sum of money that is an aggregate fund of all of the consumers. So this the project would start similar to uh, any crowdfunding campaign. 
you have say you know a hundred consumers that like, I'm interested in this game you've put together a nice little pitch and video or whatever I'm gonna take my I'm gonna take my contribution to this project which may be you know fifty dollars a hundred dollars whatever and I'm going to send that to the war chest for this project so <clears throat> you have X amount of consumers they're interested in the game and they uh, effectively send this money to a smart contract and that smart contract will start issuing a fractionally divided amount of what's in the war chest to do the developers per unit time so what that means is every every month two weeks whatever cadence then it's going to take a certain amount that was predetermined and it's going to send it to the developers so the project progresses forward the users have the ability so the developers they're going to build a schema of how much money they need per month so if say that's like five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or whatever it is or maybe even less if it's just one person um, <clears throat> that money that they're going to require that now they can reevaluate that as the project moves forward and the consumers can then change their contribution amounts per month. So say, you know, I start off a game and I think it's going to be $5,000 per month. And then I realize that, oh, I found something. This would never happen, but it's going to be cheaper. And then, you know, it's going to be $2,500 per month. And then everyone can, uh, every all the consumers can just call a function on that smart contract. And then instead of dishing out um, that $5,000 per month, it changes it to $2,500. And maybe they can take the remainder back. Um, if the developer goes astray or goes missing or the whole thing blows up then you can call a function and it returns all of the money from the war chest back to your wallet um, <clears throat> and the one interesting part about this which i haven't like totally worked out in my brain so far is actual product distribution to the from the developers to the consumers so what you don't want is what you don't want is the developers just publishing a open binary and then sending it to all of the consumers because then the consumers will send it to their friend and the thing will get leaked and the idea is these are nightly builds so you know you're not playing a full featured game you're just testing out the new capabilities whatever they built in as a consumer you evaluate hey this project's going well hey this project isn't going well um, and but the problem is if you send out this binary then it just gets leaked and everybody would have it so you need something that's smarter than that what you need is an incentivization way so consumers don't leak the binary they get to the public because if they just leak every single build every month or every two months then other people are just gonna be like hey you know I'm not gonna fund this project because it'll just get leaked and etc and it's not it's not worth my time uh, it's not worth my money so what you need is the developers need to build one binary per consumer and it's going to be different and inside of that binary is going to be a signed transaction to the war chest that will disincentivize the consumer from leaking the binary so say okay I leaked the binary I'm a consumer I some other person finds it on the internet they should be able to they know where this piece of data is they should be able to extract the data that should be a signed package from the consumer so this signing has to happen every month so the consumer says it sends a signed package to the developer that gets integrated into their personal build and <clears throat> then if you can extract that if a not even a malicious um, someone that finds it so if the consumers leaked it they've uploaded it somewhere you should be able to find that and use that to call a function on the same smart contract where the funds are kept in the war chest and then from there you should do something to disincentivize that from happening so that may be that would probably be either destroying the funds or forcing the funds to go to the developers so this week this monthly cadence where um, 
caches being sent from the war chest to the developer, maybe it gets locked in. The user can't call exit anymore. And maybe they don't get the binary anymore. Or maybe they do still get the binary. I don't know. Maybe they've learned their lesson. Now, you can use something like that to keep people on track. A system where you have the ability to change or suspend funds from a game, I think is, and it, you, need, you need a trustless system blockchain or something like that you don't want to put the funds into an escrow account where you have an escrow moving these funds around because then that something might get screwed up there um, and I think a system like this if established and works out worked you know as per described there's a couple of things that I still have to work out in my brain something like this could lead to further development of of these of these games for these little for these little consoles and I think that would be super cool I mean, playing emulated games is cool, but you have so much more capabilities from these new consoles. You have Wi-Fi, you have Bluetooth. As I said, you can plug in other sensors, um, like different LoRa radios. I don't know. There's tons of stuff that you can do with them. And if you can leverage all of that and build platform-specific games, which would kind of be platform-specific, because the thing's running Linux. So once these games are finished, sure, you can run them on the little console. They would kind of be ideally suited for that. Or you could run them on another one of these handheld consoles running Linux, or you could run them on a computer or whatever. <clears throat> but, yeah, anyways, that's my idea. I was going to write a white paper, but whenever I write those, I don't think anyone reads them. Like, I always send out the PDF, and it's like 20 pages, and people are like, oh, wow, great. And then I talk to them about it later, and I'm like, you didn't read that, which is fine. But anyways, making videos right now. Update on me. So if you are new to this channel, I'm building a game using, <clears throat> I'm not going to explain the entire thing, but it's an open source Rust based uh, distributed MMO. Uh, there's a video, oh, there's other videos of that on my channel. Um, <clears throat> and I have just, I recently moved. I'm uh, living in the States right now during the global pandemic, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, starting work for a new company. and. I, fourthly, have not had enough time because I've been starting this new job to work on my game. So, but I am planning on, I have this weekend free, so I'm planning on working on it a little bit this weekend and I want to make more videos. Um, coming up next on that, uh, as far as videos go, is I think AI. No, and not like AI in the sense of like AGI, I'm talking about like monsters running around and like they attack you and run close to you um ai um and architecture around building ai so yes if you're interested in that type of stuff uh go watch my other videos and um if you are not then i guess don't i, I mean, yeah also <laughs> anyways okay like subscribe thank you goodbye and now oh shit are you kidding me fuck you dude Sorry, my machine just went to sleep. I'll edit that out. Or maybe not. We'll see.